So welcome everyone to today's webinar, Pasture for Life, Why We Champion Pasture-Fed Livestock. Today we are joined by Nikki Yoxo. Nikki is Head of Research at Pasture for Life, a farmer based in the northeast of Scotland and currently a PhD student exploring the role of nature connectedness in the agroecological transition. Today's webinar will introduce Pasture for Life, introduce the farm systems typically found on Pasture for Life farms, and share research outputs from past and current research projects relating to pastured ruminants. As always, there'll be a chance to ask questions at the end of the presentation. So ask these in the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen at any point during the presentation and I'll ask these on your behalf later on. So thank you everyone for logging in and I'll now hand over to Nikki. Brilliant, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, and I'm just gonna very quickly say hello with my camera on, but because my internet is pretty bad up here in um, the wilds of Northeast Scotland, uh, I might just turn my video off whilst I'm doing my presentation, just to make sure that it doesn't all completely fall over. Um, so yeah, really, really great to see so many of you and also quite a lot of um, names that I recognise, which is always terrifying when delivering any sort of session. So really lovely to see some of the Pasture for Life family, as it were, involved um, in the participant list today. Um, so I'm so glad you could make it this afternoon. Um, and hopefully for those of you who don't know about Pasture for Life, um, you'll go away from this session a little bit more aware of the work that we're doing across the UK and also into Ireland. Um, right, so I'm just going to uh, hopefully turn my video off just to make sure that I can keep the connection. So um, yeah, Pasture for Life is uh, an organisation that works across the UK and our um, approach is very much about championing the restorative power of grazing animals on pasture and we advocate for a future where grazing animals, so ruminants particularly, eat only their natural diet which is pasture um, and that they play a positive uh, ecological role in our landscape and we're particularly interested in this kind of dual or multiple purpose role that, that ruminant animals have within our ecosystems um, and we are very much about supporting farmers to transition to these practices and we generate positive impact both in terms of the environmental animal and human health um, areas of our work as well as supporting um, that thriving rural economy and we very much are placed within a broader context of the sustainable food system as a whole so um, we think very much beyond the farm gate as an organization we do not just kind of focus on what happens on farm but we work closely and advocate for butchers, uh, processors, restaurants, retailers, uh, direct sales, and so much more. So we absolutely take that agroecological approach of the ecology of the entire food system. And we are not just focusing our attention on the, um, the fields and the pastures. It's, it's so much more than that. Um, we, oh, sorry, I'm not clicking forward. No, oh, I'm not seeing my, Oh, there we go. Sorry, obviously on a delay. Um, so our movement, um, some of you may will, will know this already because I could see that we had members within the uh, within the participants, but we were set up in 2011 as a very small not-for-profit organisation, um, but we have grown significantly in the last um, nearly 12 years. Uh, we have over uh, around, well, around 900 members paying um, £100 a year to be a member, and that does not mean that they have to be farmers. So our members could be absolutely anybody. We have farmers, we have, um, uh, we have processors, we have butchers, we have restaurants, we have members of the public who are passionate about pasture systems, we have academics, researchers, all sorts of different people join as members, and that gives them access to our very on, uh, lively online forum um, where there's a huge wealth of knowledge and expertise. It means that they can engage with research projects that we're, we're taking part in, um, which I'll talk a bit more about in a moment. Um, it means that they can access our regional network of support and there are various other projects happening, particularly in um, farming in protected landscape uh, focus areas in England at the moment. So that £100 a year is hugely valuable and means that our membership really is very diverse because as I said we don't just focus on farmers although about three quarters of our members are farmers. We operate as a um, like a charitable NGO or a not-for-profit um, community interest company um, but we are very much grounded um, within the movement of agroecology and regenerative grazing systems and we have over 150 certified farms so that means that these farms apply for certification and they get audited on a regular basis to demonstrate that their ruminant livestock are eating only pasture or conserved forage, so essentially hay or silage. 
um, and those farms can then sell their products, whether it's the meat or the dairy or its fibre products as pasture for life certified. And those certified farm numbers are growing um, every month. We have more and more farmers that are joining us um, as becoming certified farms, which is increasing availability of the products that we certify. For many farms though, certification isn't necessarily the goal and for various reasons, um, they may not want to seek certification, but many are very much on that journey. And the community aspect of our organisation is absolutely central to what we do. And, actually helps us to engage with research, particularly in my area of work, um, with a participatory focus that promotes and privileges farmers at the absolute centre of what we're doing. So to think more about the wider context that we're working in, as many of you will know, probably all of you will know that grass, uh, grazed landscapes make up that vast proportion of the UK land area. And these are landscapes that have evolved alongside rum ruminants. Um, and the products that these animals provide, both as a source of uh, a dietary source of nutrition and also the products that, for example, wool, leather, etc. But also much more than that, the additional goods that livestock bring have been um, valuable to, to humans for centuries, for, for many, 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 many years. But in the last 70 years, since the Green Revolution, that livestock industry has become very much reliant on quite destructive management practices that are linked to cheap fossil fuel energy um, and the increased uh, presence of grain or concentrate feed, often which is the impacts of which are offshored um, out of the UK. Um, and that vital role of ruminants in providing particularly fertility within more organic based systems, food and fibre, um, essentially for free has not been or has been forgotten and we aim very much to correct that. Um, we know that you know as I said 70% of land in the UK is farmed and 70% of that is grazed so that's just pasture but actually we know many of our farmers graze way more um, land than just pasture they're actually integrating their animals into arable rotations and we have lost so much of our soil organic carbon due to more intensive agricultural practices and that obviously that causes a significant risk as we're facing a climate crisis. So as an organisation our work is set out in three pillars, credibility, community and certification and I've touched already on, on certification which is this market development, the set of standards which are reviewed every couple of years and communicating the story to the wider public um, who provide the pull factor needed for that farm level change, so developing the market to enable farmers to make sure that they've actually got a market to service and creating those mechanisms to ensure farmers are fairly rewarded for their work. Community I've also touched on in terms of the membership. So we do a huge amount of work to spread awareness of the benefits of our systems through peer-to-peer -peer knowledge exchange, education comms events, and bringing more and more people into our network from all sorts of um, different organizations and walks of life to develop um, that community of change. And then very much kind of my work, which is around the credibility of our systems and our organisation, which is working closely with the academic community to build the evidence underpinning everything that we do, working with peers to ensure that pasture fed thinking threads through all work streams and also ensuring that policymakers understand um, the, the benefits that pasture fed systems can bring um, and ensuring that the right frameworks exist to take those solutions to scale. So how can we inform policymakers to take what we're learning and apply that on a, on a wider basis? And in terms of our delivery, as I've already mentioned, farmers are at the heart of that. Uh, we bring them into research projects. Their enthusiasm and generosity are at the core of our learning and development provision. The amount of mentoring and support that is being run is just phenomenal. Um, and the, their eagerness to farm in a way that is sensitive to um, e the ecological requirements of the farm that is working to a triple bottom line of people, planet and profit is something that we really look to reward through the certification. But as I've said, not all member farms need to be certified. And in order to um, ensure that that community culture can really grow and recognising that this is very much a journey and not everybody is ready to certify, we have 15 regional groups around the UK. Um, and that brings our members together in local and regional settings. And we also work in Ireland as well, where we actually work both across the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland. And this has significantly improved our membership retention and has generated, if you like, 15 times the service that we were able to deliver because we can offer very localised support systems for our farmers. And then further 
to that we have working groups such as the research group which I um, initially kind of was overseeing when I started with Pasture for Life and I now have a research assistant Jenna who brilliantly manages that research group um, which creates this two-way dialogue between agroecological farmers and academics and it really helps us to shape relevant research projects and to feedback on research activities and that's something that we really noticed is that Often research papers will come out that will say something and many of the most progressive farmers I know will say, well, we knew that we've been doing that for five or 10 years. So we recognize that whilst a huge amount of work goes into knowledge transfer down the way from academics who are perceived to be the experts through knowledge uh, exchange and knowledge transfer provision, which is required by the research impact um, knowledge exchange systems and frameworks that exist within research institutions and academic institutions, actually there's a lot of work that needs to happen going the other way, which it will enable our farmers to say, um, you know, we've been doing that and we found it didn't work, so we've been doing this. So an example of this would be um, a research institute in Scotland contacting me saying we're looking at setting up some trials um, for mob grazing sheep to um, assess um, the impacts on anthelmintic uh, use and whether we, need, we can use mob grazing as a way to reduce the amount of, of wormer that we're going to be using on these sheep. Um, but the experiment design didn't really reflect what some of the mob grazing um, community would be doing. It definitely was more of a kind of um, rotational grazing system, 21 day, day rotation, of which there's actually been quite a lot of research already. So it was an opportunity for me and some other farmers to feed in and say, well, actually, um, you know, that's a great research outcome. We'd really like to see that. But in five years, when your outputs are ready, the farming systems will have moved on. So, you know, actually designing experiments that are at the cutting edge of, of farming practice is going to be far more useful for us as those impact, uh, impacts are um, and outputs are released in the future. So as I said, we uh, do a lot of work around credibility and this really is kind of my, my passion and something that I am so privileged to be part of and you can see here just a, an opportunity for me to reflect on some of the work that we've been doing and that picture at the bottom um, is actually me and uh, a child that came on one of our farm walks we always make sure particularly in Scotland where I'm based and I run a lot of activities with my colleague Clem um, that we have all of our farm walks as kind of child friendly spaces and that uh, opportunity for inclusion and, and benef benefiting from diversity of people present um, on our farm walks and ensuring equal access to um, activities is really important to us. Um, hilariously, someone emailed me this morning and said um, that photo you sent of two children looking in a hole, and I uh, was very grateful that they they considered me to look young enough that I could be mistaken for a child. But um, yeah, it was a, a great opportunity to explore um, worms and dung beetles with with children, and actually broadening um, that advocacy piece out beyond just farmers, and actually thinking more about the communities within which we we live and work. Um, the top photograph. Uh, was a piece of work that we've I've been really proud of kind of being part of over the last year where we're working in collaboration with Soil Mentor. Um, so you'll see over on the right hand side there's a whole load of different um, logos and Visa Cycle um, is the overarching company that runs Soil Mentor. It's a brilliant app um, that many of our members use and actually being a member means that you get a significant discount on their Regen platform which is their um, kind of advanced level um, app um, uh, option. And this was for, uh, a, an opportunity for farmers to come together. We ran two of these events, one in Herefordshire, one in Perthshire, brought farmers together and taught them how to use the app so that they could take um, kind of control and leadership of soil management for themselves on their farms. So they didn't feel they had to rely on other people to do that for them or bring in additional expertise, but they could use the app to record what they're seeing as they're just walking around doing their normal work on the farm um, and also go out and dig holes and assess soil compaction and infiltration rates and, and earthworm counts. So working with other people to then build that data set. So working with Soil Mentor to get farmers to use this app so that we then have um, an, an anonymous, I can never say it, anonymous data set that allow us to um, to actually reflect on what's going on on pasture fly farms and you know, what's the average earthworm count, for example, or um, you know what are we seeing, how are we seeing changes in species richness actually on farms, gives us great opportunity to start digging into some of these things in a little bit more detail. 
Um, we've also been working with Vet Sustain, which is an organisation that promotes sustainability within the veterinary um, industry, the veterinary sector. And this is a piece of work where the Vet Sustain Food and Farming Group and the Pasture for Life Research Group came together and actually developed a toolkit and a guidance document to share with vets so that when they are working with pasture for live farm clients um, that they understand the decisions that those farmers might be making and they understand the practices that they might be seeing on those farms. We recognise that within um, conventional uh, veterinary education that the focus often is on more conventional systems, conventional farm systems, and it's very, um, you'd be very, uh, I would say lucky, but um, it would be rare possibly for for vet students on their EMS, so their kind of placement, to have access to, for example, 100% pasture-fed livestock farms. So often, um, young vets or you know newly um, qualified vets come into this, come into the industry without really knowing that these additional farm types might um, exist. So this is our way of trying to initiate some of that. Um, exploration into how we work better with our veterinary colleagues um, to support that progress in, um, in vets being able to help uh, monitor health um, and support pasture fed farms. And then you'll see there's a whole range, as I said, of logos over here, which relate to most of the projects that we've been involved with. So I will come, I will cover some of these in more detail, um, Seek Slip and Suscat. Um, however, I had an absolute nightmare with my slides and some of my Suscat information has disappeared, but I will hopefully be able to still go through that with you. Um, but the Seek Slip and Suscat projects have now finished and we're now seeing um, the research outputs from those are being published. So I'll share a bit of that with you. Um, Pathways is a project that has, it's a Horizon 2020 project. It's been um, running for the last uh, year and a bit um, so we're just going into year two um, and that is a project that we are working very closely with the University of Reading but we're actually one of I think 35 organisations from across Europe who are coming together to develop pathways for sustainable livestock systems and sustainable food more broadly um, across Europe. And ReLivestock um, is a sort of very similar project. Actually, it's about the same number of um, partners, most of whom are the same. And this is actually looking at resilient livestock systems. So sustainability and resilience, um, slightly different concepts, and actually resilient livestock in a, a climate, in a system of climate change and biodiversity um, loss is obviously something that we take very seriously and, and is a really worthy a piece of research that we're supporting and for that particular project we're going to be looking um, in detail at uh, partially beef systems um, and how they are able to uh, particularly through different grazing management offer biodiversity benefits alongside, benefits alongside um, carbon sequestration and mitigation impacts. Um, Pilio is an organisation that we've been working with through a number of DEFRA test and trial um, projects to develop opportunities for um, natural capital based finance. Um, so reflecting on the work that our farmers do and increased levels of biodiversity that they tend to see on their farms, this was um, a way of creating almost like a marketplace to support those farmers, not necessarily just to change practice and improve, but to maintain good practice. And the Bionutrient Institute, which is based in the US, um, have been working with us to uh, take samples of beef. So we sent um, something like 30 steaks um, and a whole pile of uh, soil and grass samples and also dung samples over to them at the end of last year. Um, and all of those samples will be processed over the coming months. It's quite a slow process, um, but they will be sampled to try and uh, quantify better the nutrient density of these different um, meats that are being produced from our systems. Um, so I've talked quite a lot about the different um, things that we've been doing, and I just want to kind of go into a little bit more of the detail. Um, and I want to kind of draw your attention to the risk of um, considering carbon tunnel vision. So um, I really like this um, uh, this graphic that has been produced um, because I think it really highlights one of the challenges that farmers particularly, I would say, feel that they are faced with, where you know we understand collectively that we have to have a transition to more sustainable, resilient livestock systems and farm systems in general. But often, particularly the public, we often perceive that the public um, discourse around this focuses predominantly on carbon emissions and that particularly relates to methane um, as a result of you know governments not getting a handle on on fossil fuels 
20, 30 years ago. So you know, we know that reductions in methane would have a very quick impact on greenhouse gas emissions in the atmosphere. And so the focus has very much been on um, enteric fermentation, which produces methane um, and is an absolutely incredible uh, feat of evolution that an animal like a cow can, can you know, produce the amount of, um, of meat and dairy and just exist and live and thrive only on pasture. Um, I definitely couldn't uh, live on, on, just, on just lettuce. So um, I'm always in awe that, that cows managed to do this so brilliantly. Um, but we do have this risk that, that, that the debate becomes very narrow um, and that, that we lose the opportunity to think more holistically about the systems within which we are working. So, you know, we know that sustainability relates to so much more than carbon emissions. Agricultural practice is also highly variable and livestock do and absolutely should represent so much more than just a food source. I've already made reference to fibre, um, but actually, particularly in other countries, they are um, a source uh, of wealth. Um, banking can take place using livestock as a currency um, and also they offer huge potential for draft and um, draft animals, you know, being able to pull things around. And there are um, a number of research projects uh, and, and just through kind of indigenous knowledge that we know that ownership of, of the livestock can be very much related to um, emancipation of women as well in some, in some uh, cultures. So this is not a simple, problem it is a wicked problem um, and it requires a messy solution and that can be very difficult for, for us as humans to kind of um, get our heads around sometimes um, and it inevitably means that there is going to be debate and uh, disagreement but we something that we do know is that single outcome management always has unintended consequences so for example um, the increase in using nitrogen fertilizer to address the issue of um, hunger always has unintended consequences and we've seen those um, over the last 70 years. So what we try and do is to increase the complexity with which we consider these systems and help other people to recognise that the role ruminants can play addressing all of those challenges, whether it's biodiversity loss, poverty, water quality, um, health, resource scarcity, um, consumption, air pollution, etc. So one of the projects that I mentioned earlier, the Seag Slip project, um, this was led by Lisa Norton from the Centre for Ecology and uh, Hydrology, in, uh, she's based in Lancaster, and this um, project has now um, ended and has been um, producing uh, some fantastic outputs that uh, Lisa and the team were looking very much at um, focusing on pasture for life farms and you'll see there that it says PFLA um, I just did a copy and paste there and forgot to take the A off um, so just to clarify we are pasture fed livestock association um, trading as pasture for life so we went through a rebrand um, at the end of last year so if you see PFLA it is us uh, it's just that we have uh, gone through that rebrand um, and the research we seek slip provided strong indications that our approach to livestock to production um, is resilient and viable um, financially, as well as contributing to that wider public goods delivery, despite variability within and between farms. So not all pasture for life farms are the same, just as not all farms are the same, um, but generally as a group of farms that we can, we have seen that there is a resilience and a viability to those farm systems and that the wider public goods delivery absolutely can be met. Um, in terms of the actual kind of assessment of um, species richness, on farm, pasture for life plots were more species rich and contained more legume and forb species and lower proportions of ryegrass than those on food grasslands. Um, so we we have seen that evidence that our, that the pasture on pasture for life member, not even necessarily certified farms, um, is is more species rich, and so the vegetation height was greater um, in the pasture for life farms than CS, which is the countryside survey plots of either improved or neutral grassland. So that that uh, structural diversity obviously plays a significant role in creating habitat for different um, plants uh, for different animals. Sorry, and the findings indicated that that pasture fed livestock is. Uh, systems um, may be beneficial for grasslands and wider ecosystems and something that we've been trying to share more broadly um, on our uh, website is biodiversity case studies. So I think we have now over 20 biodiversity case studies from across the UK that highlight um, the, the, the increase in biodiversity that our farms have seen since moving towards pastured systems and trying to um, 
create, I guess, awareness of, um, of that change, but also that not all farms are, um, are responsible, for example, for monoculture perennial ryegrass um, fields, but that there are other, uh, other farm or other sward types available. Um, one of the other aspects of seed slip that um, we were really interested in digging into a bit further was the economic be um, benefits of pasture systems. So um, I split these out by, for example, um, breeding sheep flocks. So um, the top pasture for life farm, um, so the, the top being the uh, financially um, uh, best performing farms, make more gross margin than the top um, FBS, which is the um, Farmer Business Survey farmers. So pasture for life farms are making £106 a head gross margin compared to 93 And pasture for life farms based in the uplands have a much better gross margin at £41 a head than the average upland farmer. So this is for sheep, remember, of £21 a head. So almost double um, the gross margin um, in upland sheep flocks. On suckler beef farms, again, almost double the benchmarked FBS farms at over £1,158 a head for the average, compared to 516 and 540 for upland and lowland systems. Um, sorry, up lowland at 516 and upland 540. So um, on suckler beef farms, we can see that there's a significant um, increase in the output um, for those pasture for life farms. And whilst about beef finishing, although we don't have many um, dedicated finishing farms in pasture for life, most are suckler herds. Um, but whilst beef finishing output, like the amount is output is lower on pasture for life farms, but the costs sit at significant reduction compared to 300, so £54 a head per animal to finish um, in terms of cost to the farmer compared to £309 a head for the farm business survey um, sample. And that is absolutely down to um, reductions in um, inputs such as grain or concentrate feed. Um, and because our farmers are having to rely on really um, kind of comprehensive grassland management in order to make the most from pasture, many of our farms are able actually to um, outwinter um, or reduce housing significantly. Um, so when you're having to kind of make do with less, the whole system has to change, which can significantly drive down costs. Um, and there's a, a, a link to um, the, the news on our, on our website um, that uh, is available to give more detail and actually the tables of those figures as well. Um, this is where my uh, slideshow went completely wrong and I've lost most of my text here and realised this about two minutes before the webinar started. So very quickly, just want to um, whiz through some of the SUSCAT findings. So led uh, in the UK by Dr Gillian Butler, who's based at Newcastle, and her colleague Hannah Davis, also based at Newcastle. And they were looking at the nutritional quality of pasture-fed beef and dairy. Um, and they found that uh, those animals on 100% pasture-fed diet had a significantly increased omega-3 to 6 ratio. Um, and obviously omega-3 is that fatty acid, it's that, that thing that we all need to have a, um, a functioning brain. And often people um, look to oily fish to, to, get, that, um, to get that omega-3 ration, if you like. Um, but with the challenges that we obviously see in terms of the sustainability of our fishing systems, actually utilising um, pasture-fed beef or lamb as a way to access that omega-3 might offer um, a more appropriate sustainable in the broader sense um, option than, than enabling um, fishing within potentially unfished areas. Um, SUSCAT also found that um, whilst they also did some uh, financial analysis and in the farms that they were looking at they did see a reduction in output, um, reduction in amount of uh, product produced so potentially a reduction in um, the financial gain to the farm however that was more than made up for by the ability of those farms to engage successfully in agri-environment schemes or bring in finance through other diversification, such as um, uh, kind of almost eco-tourism level of, um, of tourism uh, beyond kind of agri-tourism, but actually kind of highlighting and, and making the most of some of those more natural features found on the farm. And um, some of that data as well from Suscat that I was going to share kind of showed that basically um, the fatty acid profile of, of uh, beef and dairy um, is uh, 
much improved um, if you go from grain finished to organic. Um, like if you go from conventional grain finished to organic, there's a significant improvement. If you go from organic to 100% pasture bed, again, significant change. But if you then take that next step to very diverse pastures, particularly what we might see within conservation grazing type arrangements, that's actually where the omega-3 to 6 ratio is significantly changed. Um, just phenomenal change in how in, in how beneficial that omega-3 then becomes um, in terms of the, the balance of omega-3 to omega-6. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we know that, as I've said, the majority of pasture fly farmers uh, or pasture fly farms tend to have more diverse swords. So we're seeing that shift from um, kind of simplified systems to more complex systems, and then the, the potential human health benefits or gains that we're getting as a result of that. Um, I'm going to stop there. Um, I did want to talk a little bit about um, the uh, some of the gaps that we're finding in the research and some of the things that are yet to be published. Um, so I might just, uh, what I might do actually is just turn off uh, my screen share and then I can do that um, maybe with my camera on instead. So I hope that was useful and I think I just about stayed to time as well. <laughs> um, so um, I might just, yeah. yeah, I might just go very quickly through some of the um, the gaps that we found in the research, if that's okay, and then we can yeah, absolutely. Um, do questions, is that right? Perfect. Yeah. yeah, so some of the gaps that we know exist in the research, and these are the things that we're really trying to push um, with the various projects that we're involved in, is that the carbon sequestration under different grazing management regimes isn't particularly um, well explored, in particular in the UK context. Um, Sarah Morgan, who was at Rothamsted and is now based at, um, at Harper Adams, has done some brilliant work around this. I think it's being written up and hopefully we'll see some publications of that um, soon. Um, but what she found was that mob grazing, for example, quite an intense actually cell grazing approach compared to set stocking, significantly improved the carrying capacity or increased the carrying capacity of the land, making it more efficient and extended the grazing season. Um, some of the things that we're not sure about with that are things like the carbon sequestration that was happening at the same time. Um, and I think probably because some of these projects don't last long enough for us to be able to see those changes in the soil. Um, biodiversity as a result of mob grazing, um, again, is something that we are wanting to see more. And there's a research project that's just kicking off in Scotland that's looking at that. And I know that ADAS were running various um, mob grazing trials as well. And I'm mentioning mob grazing because many of our farmers tend to use it. Not all, but the majority of our uh, member farms are implementing some level of either adaptive, uh, multi pellet grazing, holistic pan grazing, mob grazing. Um, I think very few of our farms um, are utilising a sort of set stock system and those that are working as graziers and are um, addressing kind of conservation grazing requirements, even that would still be kind of, you know, moving animals onto different sites at different times of the year. So animals wouldn't just sort of stay in one place for the entire um, time of the year. And what we don't see is research in integrated land use. So um, this idea that I mentioned earlier that, um, you know, we kind of have this amount of pasture and this is what is feeding our livestock. But actually, um, we don't have particularly um, good models that reflect that a, uh, a cereal crop may be grazed off by lambs in the spring. It may then produce that cereal crop, so wheat, for example then it would be potentially followed by a cover crop that could be grazed by cattle. So that one field could actually contribute to the production of three different food types and being able to assess and understand that and model that just isn't happening at the moment. And we've got a real gap in, in being able to model truly agroecological regenerative systems because they're just not being able to be accounted for within some of that modeling that's happening. Um, and the other thing that we're not, we don't have enough research, particularly in the UK, on this. A lot of research on this in um, tropical settings, but is silver pasture and how integrating trees into the livestock systems, particularly pastured livestock systems, the the impact that that has on um, on the on the outputs, on efficiency, but also um, you know animal health, welfare, nutrition, and then the knock on effect to human nutrition. So all of these things are being researched, but there are still significant gaps, and those are all things that we're trying to to work on. I'll stop there because I think there's questions. Perfect, thank you. It's nice to hear about the work that you're doing and it's good to see that the local communities and everything are getting involved um, with the work that you do. So yeah, we do have three questions. If there are any more, please just answer them um, in the Q&A function at the bottom. Um, so we'll just start here with the first one um, and it's quite a long one. So I'm glad to know the mission Pasture for Life has. The kind of fertilizers used may affect the quality of pasture and eventually affect pasture-fed livestock. Um, 
And it says, are there any guidance on the fertilizers? I've experienced strange fishy smell coming from some free ranged eggs. I doubt that's affected by the food eaten by the hens. I'm conscious how much chemicals the livestock has digested and how much well-being of the livestock has been affected. Okay, I'm not an egg expert, so I wouldn't want my husband to get to that. <laughs> talk about nitrogen fertilizer in pastured systems. So through our certification standards, we don't um, ban nitrogen fertilizer. Um, we're not an organic certification standard. We rely heavily on working with um, organic farmers and growers who, who enable the audit of our, um, of our certification standards. And a lot of our, for example, health and welfare um, standards are draw, you know, we draw upon organic standards. But as I said before, we recognize that many of our farmers are on a journey. And we, if farmers don't want to use um, synthetic fertilizer, then they can go organic. Um, and we recognize that for some farmers being on that journey and moving to a pastured system may require them actually to think about their nitrogen fertilizer use to create enough pasture for them to then make that shift. However, what we then see is most of them knock that right back. So our best practice, um, and we have recommended as well as required outcomes in our standards, and we have a recommendation that farmers reduce uh, synthetic fertilizer. And actually we then, you know, kind of point them to the community to help them to, to do that. So rather than saying you should use less and this is the percentage you should reduce by, we say we recommend that you, you know, that you make significant reductions in nitrogen fertilizer and that you only use it as and when it's really needed and that using the resource of the community that we offer can help you to manage that, particularly looking at other people in your, in your locality or in your region who have been on that journey. We have some farms, there's a farm not far from where I am, who went past the fed um, certified and just stopped using synthetic fertilizer. Um, and that was for them based on cost, like the cost of doing that was just really difficult. Um, and we know that it has implications for the species mix within the, within the sport. So um, I would say that, uh, yeah, I mean, the bottom line is that we allow nitrogen fertilizer within our standards, but we recommend that it's reduced and many of our farmers don't use it. And actually, I don't, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head. I, I should know this, um, but many of our certified farms are dual organic and pasture life certified. And the ones that aren't, it's primarily because they're graziers who don't have sole responsibility for the land that they're grazing on, which means that you can't necessarily go organic, whereas pasture for life, you can have a bit more flexibility. Um, but, you know, there's a great book, um, of, I think it's David Montgomery's book around, you know, you are what you eat eats. Um, and so that might be worth reading uh, in terms of uh, the impact that what, you, what the animals that you're eating are eating um, can significantly change the flavour, um, but also um, the benefit to, to human health. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, so are you seeing increased engagement from the scientific and ecology community around the understanding and benefits of PFL practices? Yeah, definitely. And I think that's a capacity thing. I think that question was for me. And um, yeah, Ian, so uh, my role didn't exist uh, two and a bit years ago. So having a dedicated resource that is uh, focused on engaging with the scientific community obviously has a, has a massive um, impact on that. Our research group has been absolutely key to that. So on our research group, we have a number of researchers. So I've already mentioned Lisa Norton and Gillian Butler, um, both who have run um, research projects that relate to pasture for life. But we also have Lawrence Smith, who is leading the work at Reading, um, and a number of their colleagues as well that come dip in and out of the research group. And having that opportunity every single month to have an academic come and talk to us about their work, and then we're able to build that relationship with them and feed back into the work that they're doing has been so, so important. Um, and I think it, you know, I made um, earlier in the presentation, I talked about an example of where a research institute came to me and asked for some advice. Um, and we're seeing that all the time. And we also run um, every region. So we've got our 15 regions and they all run at least, um, it was four, but it's going up to six events. Um, every year and in Scotland we actually run 12 events in a year and we're working really closely with the regional facilitators to invite local academics to try and come to some of those farm walks. I think the most important thing is if we need to get more researchers and more academics out on farms and not just kind of existing within their own research platform farms um, but actually coming out onto farms that are doing this stuff on the ground and seeing what's happening and how farmers are re uh, responding to the challenges that they're seeing. And I think a lot of that has, has made a significant difference to that relationship that we have with researchers, for sure. Fantastic, thank you very much. The final, oh, there's another question just come in, but the question is, 
Does pasture fed beef have the capacity to cover UK beef demand in the future? Do you think our current consumption habits could be met with a shift to a completely sustainable system? Um, there's been some really interesting research that was undertaken by IDRI, which is a French think tank and research institute, and that was um, part commissioned by the Food, Farm and Countryside Commission and also the Soil Association. Um, and that was the 10 years for agroecology. Um, on their assumptions, we would have to, we could feed the UK, in fact, we could feed Europe um, agroecologically by significantly changing these practices. And they focused primarily on um, pasture ruminant systems and then um, any grain that was grown for livestock would be going to pigs and poultry, so monogastrics. Um, they uh, made an assumption of a reduction in meat, uh, meat consumption. So there is a significant part of that research project that accounted for dietary change. And this has then led, so I'm working with some of those same researchers on the pathways and the re livestock project. And when I started asking them about increased carrying capacity, for example, or integrating livestock um, into uh, arable systems, and actually we might need more livestock to meet those demands, um, where does that sit? And this is where we started to realize that these types of systems just aren't being accounted for in the models. So the models that are used to determine what, uh, what our farm systems could look like in the future are always going to be full of holes because they're models, you know, they're computer generated models. And um, they're really useful, but they're not the absolute truth. Um, but they can't currently account for some of these other practices that we're seeing that actually demonstrate an increased carrying capacity. So I guess the bottom line is we don't know because we're not able to model that yet because we can't model all the types of systems that we are, that we find our pasture for life farms are using to get the most out of their ground and to get the most out of their grass and out of the you know the, the grazing management. Um, so. Yeah, it's a work in progress answering answering that question. Um, I mean, we know, for example, in Scotland um, that we are significantly producing significantly more beef than than is eaten. Um, you know, we we overproduce, um, but a lot of that is supported by by grain. Um, but that is also driven by the uh, the seeking um, consistency on the in the market. So supermarkets want the same kind of animal um, to be slaughtered, so that whether you buy a steak in Glasgow or in Wick or in London, and you're going to get the same, you're going to get the same product. But actually, that drive for consistency is the thing that is kind of quite often driving the requirement for, for that grain finishing and also this the um fuel to happen um, that would enable us to really test that that potential, that, that question. Thank you. I think we just lost you at the end of that question. Um, but hopefully everyone um, heard what you were I mean, saying. I'll turn my video off just because I think it's, it's struggling. No problem at all. Um, we're, we're on the final question. So it's, um, do you know an emerging standard for mob or amp grazing, both organic and PFL are clear? Might it be helpful to integrate mob grazing as a specific standard? I understand the benefits of keeping the regenerative approach broad, but, but might things get pinned down as we move forward with knowledge of the benefits of mobs? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. And I think that the key part of that, that the A in AMP stands for adaptive. Um, and when you start creating um, uh, kind of standards that become too uh, set in stone, it reduces the ability for the farmer to have the autonomy to be adaptive to their system. Um, and I think that, um, yeah, I mean, there are, I would probably recommend uh, something like uh, ecological outcome verification, which is the kind of savoury approach to um, uh, monitoring the outcomes that are found through uh, holistic management, for example, on grounds, rather than saying this is the standard, actually let's find ways to help you um, meet outcomes that are right for your farm. Um, and actually Pastor Flight has had conversations about how do we create almost a, a point of reflection for farmers so that they can think about what they're trying to manage for and whether they're actually achieving that, a bit akin to outcome ecological outcome verification. So yeah, I think that EOV model is preferable to a fixed set of standards that say, this is how you should mob graze, because it's so dependent on responding to the time of year, uh, the type of animal, the stock classes that you're running, um, what outcomes you're trying to manage for, whether it's purely production or whether it's biodiversity. So for example, on our farm, um, we use, um, a, I guess, what's well, holistic land grazing, because we use holistic management, but um, a version of adaptive multi paddock grazing, and there are some areas, particularly because of the habitat management we're trying to do, that we will graze uh, a very small number of cattle on a big space, even though we're moving them daily, 
so the constant for us is always daily moves um but the thing that changes is the size of the paddock um and then just kind of applying that and saying all farmers should do it in this way i think would actually be again um detrimental there'd be unintended consequences of that um, so we need to keep things as flexible and as open as possible, rather than saying to farmers, this is how you should be managing. Um, so, yeah, I think that, that flexibility is key. Fantastic. We do have one more question from Ian that's just come in. Um, you spoke about the frequent absence of holistic viewpoint and policy towards livestock with currently an overfocus on carbon. Are you aware of any effective academic projects to address this and factor in all of the benefits of pastured livestock? Yeah, so both Pathways and Re Livestock, which I mentioned, and both of them have websites. So you can go to, I think it's Pathways, I don't want to say .co .uk, so I don't think it is. But if you look at Pathways Research and Re Livestock Research, um, both of them have websites and they're both trying to do exactly that. So for Pathways, we're using the public goods tool or a version of the public goods tool that was developed by the Organic Research Centre to, um, to actually map um, and assess. Um, the broadest, in broadest possible terms, the impact of, of different farm systems, and those are all across Europe, and they're not just pastured systems, they're all sorts of different um, management approaches and systems that are being ma mapped and analysed. Um, we're also looking specifically at mob grazing as um, for within the UK, so our UK part of that project is looking at pasture for life certified farms that are implementing a form of adaptive multi paddock grazing um, and looking at the biodiversity benefits, um, and also looking at some of the carbon footprinting of those systems. And within Pathways, we're also looking at the nutritional element as well. So looking at kind of a food basket, if you like, um, and, and uh, undertaking the LCA, um, so life cycle assessment, the life cycle analysis of the, the foods within that basket, um, and then reflecting that back to animal health and welfare and one health uh, metrics as well. So we're taking a really holistic view and re livestock is going very much down that same line, that kind of one health, one welfare approach, um, and looking across a number of different um, uh, metrics. Um, and in the UK, that specifically relates to 100% pasture fed. And then in other countries, they're applying those same metrics, but to different systems, so that we have a broad uh, range of systems that are being analysed across Europe. Fantastic. Thank you. It's great to hear um, about the work that Pasture for Life are doing. Um, so thank you for that. Um, so that's it from us today. Attendees, thank you for logging in. I hope you found that beneficial and informative.